Just a quick word on uh, the, the baptisms. If you are interested in that, um, we can still meet before the picnic next week. So it's not like a doors closed kind of thing at all. Um, yeah, okay. Just trying to think if there was anything else. The other night, maybe like a week ago, uh, my son and I were watching a movie called Act of Valor. Act of Valor is about Navy SEALs and a mission to get in the middle of a planned terrorist attack. Like it's not anything you haven't seen before in more than one way. But this movie was unique because the cast are actual active duty Navy SEALs. And maybe like five professional actors otherwise. Uh, as a result, the dialogue is a little stilted. Um, it's not what you would call like a well acted movie, uh, but that's because they're not acting. Like, they, these, these guys are the real deal. Um, interestingly, there's this scene at the end where one of the uh, seals is with his daughter, and that's the other thing about the movie. The um, families are the actual families of the soldiers. So this girl, it's the dad looking at the girl, and she has teeth where in the beginning of the movie, when you saw her smile, she didn't have teeth. Like she didn't have, she was missing some teeth in the middle. The reason for that is they had to shoot around, they had to film around their deployment schedules. So the movie actually took two years to finish. So I just, I find that really interesting. Um, I don't think this is a huge spoiler involved in, in the, the film, but there's a funeral scene and you, you might be, or probably are familiar with this, that when a SEAL is buried, uh, the members of his team take their trident that's on their dress uniform, and they pound it into the casket. So, because I'm me, uh, I see that and I think, I want to know more about that. How long have they been doing that? Is that something they've been doing ever since the SEALs became a thing? Have they been doing it since Vietnam? Have underwater demolition teams done something like that, like in World War II? No, uh, they've actually been doing it since 2006. Uh, it was at the funeral of a soldier named Mark Lee, who was the first SEAL to lose his life as part of Operation Iraqi Freedom. Um, but what I also wanted to know was, were they giving up their trident for good? Like, is it the kind of thing where this means so much to me that I'm willing to part with this precious item? Like, do they only get the one? And the answer is kind of yes and kind of no. They are just given the one. Like, on the day that they officially become seals, they, they receive the trident. However... After that, what they do is they go buy a new one because you can buy a new one. Like, this won't be a surprise, but on army bases or military bases, there are department stores. And you can buy a Trident on, in that store. Uh, you can also buy a real, actual Trident online. Um, I found it, like it, it took maybe a minute to, to find one that was genuine, like not a sticker, not some plastic replica, but like the real deal. You can buy the same one they wear. It'll cost you about 20 bucks. And you don't need to demonstrate any proof that you have a right to wear this or that you have a right to own this. You don't have to show like a seal identity card or something. And I'm pretty sure they don't even really have those, those cards. Uh, anyone can, can get their hands on it. Again, this, I don't think this is going to surprise you, but that, 
that bothers them a little bit. Like, I don't know if you've ever known any current or, or former SEALs. Uh, the one that, that I know, it, it really got under his skin that people would walk around wearing these things and not just the, the trident, but all kinds of you know, gear and real SEALs don't do that. They don't brag. They don't announce themselves. They don't have to. <laughs> They're SEALs. Like, and it bugs them because, and it bothers me, it's a big deal. Like, to become a Navy SEAL, and it's not just SEALs, to become any one of our armed forces special operators, that's a big deal, okay? And not just that, to serve in the military is a big deal. Like, it's not just the selection criteria, okay? It's not just the selection process and making it through Hell Week and, and all this sort of stuff that, that's kind of out there in the ether. It's, it's the lifestyle. Like, it's the actual active duty. Like I said, that took uh, the movie two years to film because they have these rotation cycles that are six months of active doing mission combat stuff, and then 18 months where they're getting ready for the next six months. Like, it is brutal on families. And so, for someone to wear something that they didn't earn, it's like, why do you want to do that? Why would you do that? I don't think anybody finds that unreasonable. As we talk this morning about our, our subject and, and where we'll be in the, the text, I, I just want you to know the incredible respect I have for the United States military. I am one in a very long line of people who have not just served, but served in combat. I am the first generation, for what I hope are obvious reasons, uh, to have not served. I am the son of an Air Force officer. I am the grandson of a United States Marine. You can trace back my family. I have a great grandfather who was a doughboy in World War I. I have a relative who, was, who fought at day one at Gettysburg. Like, this is a big deal to me, okay? I am grateful. As much as we should respect Okay, people who've been part of the Army, the Coast Guard, the Navy, the Air Force, the Marines. As big a deal as this is, I think being a part of the church maybe matters a little bit more. Why? Because it is the one organization, if you will, that lasts forever. It goes beyond this life. It is the only group of people for whom the Son of God gave his life. So if the Lord of the universe thought enough of the church to shed his blood, like if he loves the church that much, if the church is called the body of Christ, if the church is called the bride of Christ, we should give thought to what we think about it, to how we relate to it, what role the church plays in our lives. And if you're wondering, like, am I talking about the big C universal church or the little c local church? It's a valid question. But by and large, what you're going to find is the New Testament doesn't make much of a distinction between the two. There is a distinction, okay, for sure. In Matthew 16, after Peter tells Jesus that he believes him to be the Christ, the Son of the living God, and Jesus tells Peter that he is the rock upon whom he will build his church. Jesus says that the gate of Hades will not overpower it. 
And some people will think, okay, well, that means that no local church will ever close. And we know that's not the case. Like, the seven churches in the book of Revelation that are in the first three chapters, none of those churches exist today. Drive around here for like 10 minutes, and you'll see churches that used to exist that now don't. All right? It's not about local churches in that respect. Jesus said that the church on earth will not disappear. The gates of Hades will not overpower them. However, there really is no universal church without local churches. The authors of the New Testament never envisioned a world where individual Christians weren't fully involved and integrated participants in a local body. There is no universal church without the local church. So this morning, okay, we're going to ask the question, like, why is membership in the local church a big deal? Like, why is it that we would use a word that isn't in the Bible? Like, why would we use it as a practice? Why put emphasis on it? Do we think that this is something biblical or just like a good idea, okay? We are going to jump around a little bit in the scriptures this morning. So if you need to do some like exercises on your page turning hands, because I don't want you to, you know, pull a ligament or, or anything, just, you know, Trinity Bible Church is not responsible. Should anybody pull a muscle while turning pages? Uh, just a liability thing real quick. Um, Next week, okay, just so you know, we are going to talk about our vision for this next year that we introduced at the retreat back in March that feels like a lifetime ago. Uh, and then the week after that, we're going to start our study of uh, seven scenes from the life of Jesus in the book of John. But before that, uh, we're going to talk about why we see here that membership is a big deal. And if you're visiting this morning, we're not trying to like, I didn't know you were going to be here. This isn't like an attempt to hook you or anything. Uh, just think of this as how much you matter to us as a church and what we think is the best way to properly care for the body that's been entrusted uh, to us by the Lord. So the first passage we're going to be in is 1 Corinthians. Uh, specifically chapter 3. So this can be like a way to see how well you navigate the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians. I'm going to read one verse here in chapter 3, specifically 16. It says, do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Anytime you parachute into a verse, into a chapter, it can be like, okay, well, what's this about? What's the context and all those things? It's not very complicated. Paul is writing to a divisive, divisive church where you've got factions all over the place. And he said, this is silly. Like, y'all are out there, and you're saying that you go behind, you, you follow Paul, and another one follows Apollos, these people who were part of the building of the church in Corinth. So it's just, that's, that's pointless. The foundation, the foundation that matters is Jesus Christ. And if we build anything on that foundation that isn't of God, you know what? It's going to be burned. The church is a special place. Don't you know that it's the temple of God, that the Spirit of God dwells in you? So, this is what comes after verse 16, you people, not you, but them, who are dividing this body, you're destroying God's temple. Now, this doesn't have anything to do with the building Okay, 
This doesn't have anything to do with the walls. It doesn't have anything to do with the roof or the carpet or the plumbing. Okay? It's about the people. We've spent enough time in Hebrews that you should know that there was a place in the temple for the Ark of the Covenant called the Holy of Holies. And the Ark of the Covenant had a lid. That lid was called the mercy seat. And on the mercy seat, there were two angels with their wings kind of pointed in each other. All you got to do is watch Raiders of the Lost Ark. You can get a good picture of it. But there, in between those wings, that's where the presence of God dwelt on earth. Now, with the inauguration of the new covenant, with the advent of Christ, the Ark of the Covenant is you. You are the place where the Spirit of God dwells. And as much as this is an individual thing, it is all the more collective. Because the yous, Y-O-U's, in this verse are plural. They are not singular. Do you all know that you all are a temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in all of you. So as much as it matters for an individual Christian, it matters all the more for the body of Christ, in that as we are gathered here, this is a temple of the living God. Because you're here. Okay, so all of this is to say the local church is a big deal. The local church is a big deal. It is the dwelling place of the Spirit of the Lord on earth. Remember, Paul is writing to an individual church. There was one in Corinth. There was one in Rome. There was one in Crete, okay? Which isn't to say there aren't universal truths. They are. This is just as true for Rome as it was for Corinth, as it is for us. But it's experienced on a local level. All you got to do to be a part of that, okay, is to be here. For sure. But Paul couldn't conceive of you not being here. Every single one of his letters presumes not just your presence, but your involvement. We'll look at this towards the end, okay? But he uses the metaphor of a body, a human body. And if the arm's missing, then it can't do what the arm is supposed to do. When we return to the book of Hebrews, like towards December, the next passage we're going to study in that letter the application part, the author says, let us not give up the habit of meeting together. Let us not give up meeting together as is the habit of some. That there were people out there who said, you know what? Yeah, I'm good. I don't need that. And the author said, no, don't do that. This is the place where we spur one another on to love and good deeds. This is where we care for each other. This is where we admonish each other. This is where we challenge each other. And none of this stuff just happens, or rather, it doesn't happen very well. It doesn't happen very effectively or efficiently without leadership, okay? Without people leading the way, whatever takes place ends up being more accidental than intentional. And accidental isn't bad, but it's gonna happen all the more if it is intentional, and that requires leadership, and that's okay because God has provided leadership, okay? So you're in 1 Corinthians, now we should turn over to Ephesians, all right? 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, God enjoys Parmesan cheese. <laughs> you can pick whatever letters, you know, whatever words you need to help remember it. I just think I'm right. Like, if there is Parmesan cheese, God enjoys it. Okay, he's okay with it because he either caused it to be created or he allowed it, but that's a whole other thing. Chapter 4, all right? Specifically, verse 11 
and 12. It says, he gave some as apostles and some as evangelists. Sorry, and he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers. There are some different ways to look at this verse, these two verses, specifically the mention of apostles and prophets. Like if God gave the church apostles and prophets, does that mean we should still be looking for apostles and prophets out there? Like, does that mean I'm supposed to be an apostle? And I understand if you disagree with me on this, I'm fine with that, but I don't think I'm an apostle, okay? Because I think an apostle, by definition, is someone who has seen the risen Jesus, like with his own eyes. And I haven't done that. I would love to do that. I wouldn't mind doing that. He could show up right now. It would freak all of us out. But I haven't done that, okay? So I don't see myself as an apostle. I think that God gave the church these people in the beginning to build that foundation that Paul was talking about in 1 Corinthians, that foundation that's built on Jesus Christ. And now what he continues to provide are evangelists and pastors and teachers. And I even think that pastors and teachers grammatically is the same thing. So instead of seeing them as two different categories, you've got pastors and you've got teachers, it's actually pastor-teachers. This is a section in Ephesians. Ephesians is basically, you know, it's a six-chapter book. It divides into two big divisions. Chapters one through three talk about our character. Chapters four through six talk about our conduct. So in our conduct, he's talking about what does it take to walk in unity as a church. This is chapter four. And what God has given to the church are apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. He can get, continues to give evangelists and pastor teachers. More importantly is the why. So look again at 12. It is for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. So it's the responsibility of the leadership of the church to equip the saints and to build up the body. What do we mean by building up the body? That's an evangelistic thing, okay? It's not that you're here and we have to make sure that it's constructed well. This is more like, if you've ever messed with Legos, or I'm sorry, Lego bricks, I want to be proper in my designation there. It's finding the bricks to put them together to build the building, okay? I think the local church is a big deal. I think membership is a big deal because the local church is responsible for the stewardship of your salvation. The local church is entrusted with the stewardship of your salvation. To be clear, the local church doesn't save you. I don't save you. It's Jesus Christ who saves you. Okay? None of us get to take credit for that. We are not like a sales force that's out there with some kind of quota or something in the winter gets a pink Cadillac at the end of the year. Okay, we're not Mary Kay. God does the work. But he chooses to do the work through the local church. I would even say, and I think th these organizations agree with me, I worked for one for a long time, that parachurch organizations like Crew or the Navigators or Young Life, they understand that they are extensions of the ministry of the local church. The people who come on staff with those organizations, they can't do it unless there are people financially supporting them so that they can. People do that because it's the local church 
that mobilizes giving. It's a local church that teaches financial stewardship and what it means to support not just the work of an individual church, but also the work of missionaries. The local church has been entrusted with the stewardship of your salvation. It is God's vehicle for expanding his kingdom on earth. Okay? Now what I want you to do is flip over to 1 Peter. 1 Peter's towards the end. So you've got Hebrews. You should know where that is by now. You've got James. And then there's 1 Peter. 1 Peter is written to the diaspora. Believers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. These are persecuted people who are struggling to keep being a part of this because it's really hard to keep being a part of this. And so Peter is writing them and he's comforting them. And at the end of the book, in chapter 5, verse 1, he has a word for the leadership. 1 Peter 5, 1. Therefore, I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed, like I'm one of you, Peter says. Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples of the flock. Hey, elders, I want to make sure that you're doing this for the right reasons. I want to make sure that you're in this not for the money, because at the time, elders were financially compensated. I want you to be doing it because you want to do it. It's the will of God that you do this because you want to do it. The task, the command, like what is he exhorting the elders to do? Shepherd. Shepherd also means feed. It implies protect. And what he says is, the flock of God among you. So that begs the question, who is among you? Not just that. Over those, verse 3, allotted to your charge, meaning you you, you have a charge, you have a responsibility, a stewardship. And there have been those who have been allotted to you. Again, that begs the question, who has been allotted to you? At what point has someone been long enough and been present long enough for the leadership to be able to say, okay, this is someone who's been allotted to me? Like if you just use the analogy and you think about this open field in a place where in a time where, like, fences weren't the rage, okay? You've just got fields. And so you have your flock, and they're over here, and then you've got this sheep that's over there. What am I supposed to do about that sheep? Is that sheep part of my flock, or is it someone else's responsibility? I think the analogy is a helpful one because if that sheep was struggling, a good shepherd wouldn't ignore that. 
Like we wouldn't look at this sheep that was in distress, whose leg was broken, who was caught in a thicket or something, and say, well, clearly that's not mine. That's someone else's problem. So I'm going to ignore that. A good shepherd wouldn't do that. But the shepherd wants to know who is in their flock. And I'm not saying that membership is the only way for that to happen. But it's a really effective way for that to happen. Because through the membership process, there is a discussion of salvation. Like, I don't just want to assume that you're a believer because you say you're a believer. I want to dig a little bit to know what that means. Like, could you communicate the gospel back to me? Do you know that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone? Or is it something that you're trying to to put together yourself? Again, it's not the only way that this stuff happens, but it's a really effective and efficient way for that to happen. And it needs to happen because the local church has been entrusted with the stewardship of your salvation. Like, as part of the leadership of this body, I take that seriously. I care about you. I care about your soul. I want to know that you have been made right with God. I want to know that you have peace with God. I don't want you to be living your life under a cloud or burden of uncertainty or anxiety. I want you to have assurance of salvation because I care. If I didn't care, I shouldn't be doing this. Okay? So, this is why... Membership is a big deal because God has decided to use the local church as that temple of his spirit, that place on earth where he dwells to build up the body of Christ and to shepherd. But it's not just the stewardship of your salvation. It's also the stewardship of of your discipleship, okay? So now I want you to go back to Colossians. Remember, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. God enjoys Parmesan cheese. I trust that you will never, ever forget that now. Colossians 1. This is a beautiful chapter where Paul talks about Christ being the visible image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. I love that. He then, at the end of chapter 1, okay, so I want you to look down at verse 28. He says of him and his his team, if you will, we proclaim him. We talk about him. We talk about him in such a way that is verbally enthusiastic. Okay, it's proclaiming, preaching, explaining, exhorting, raising the volume of your voice in the time and place where stuff like this didn't exist. Like, yeah, we can use some things to amplify sound, but gosh, I really want you to hear what I have to say because it's Jesus, and Jesus is really important. Like, if you go back to verse 25, he says, Of this church I was made a minister, according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit, so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God, that is, the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but has now been manifested to his saints, to whom God willed to make known what is the riches 
of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim him. How? What's involved with proclaiming him? Admonishing every man and teaching every man, and he means person, with all wisdom. Why? So that we may present every man complete in Christ. So there's teaching, explaining what this is all about. There's admonishing. Admonishing is correcting. Okay, that involves hard conversations. It's not easy. It's not always fun, but it matters so that we may present every man or person complete in Christ. I don't know if you were ever part of a history fair or a science fair when you were in school. But you do the thing. You do your experiment. You do your research. And then you get some cardboard. And you get that trifold thing going on that sits up on the table. And you've got it all up there and it's laid out. And then you stand next to what you've done. And judges come around, and you present. And then you get a ribbon for participation. <laughs> or original sources, like I did when I did mine on the cotton gin. However, OK, this is a little different. There aren't judges going around. We're not going into heaven with like an A grade a B grade, a C grade, where someone's like, whew, I just got in. Man, the cutoff was 60, 60.01, but I'm in. What do they call the guy who finishes last in medical school? Doctor, all right? <laughs> it's not that, okay? But presenting is this idea of standing beside. Where we have this responsibility to present you complete, finished. We came across a word like this in Hebrews more than once perfect. And we think of that as like, you know, moral perfection. I don't ever do a thing wrong. It really has more to do with being a finished product. And Paul saw that as his responsibility. Here's the thing, though. He never met the Colossians. This is a town and a church that he never made it to. He never visited. And so he knew that it wasn't his direct responsibility to do that for them. He knew that that was entrusted to others. And when he went town to town and planted the churches, he planted churches. He didn't establish missionaries, okay? So it's not like Paul and Barnabas went town to town, got there, raised up some Christians and said, okay, I need two more missionaries who can keep this thing going. He didn't do that. He established churches. Then he appointed elders because he knew that that's where this happened, that's where people were going to be responsible for others to present them as finished products. And that sounds a little weird because, like, I'm not a product, I'm a person, I'm a real, you know? I get it, okay? I'm just saying that God is doing a work in you. And he is doing a work among you. And that work is leading to an end, and that end is you being conformed to the image of Jesus. And it is my responsibility. It's the elder's responsibility. And I would even say it's all of our responsibility to present each of us with teaching, with admonishment, as finished. This is why membership is a big deal. Because it's intentional. And there's an agreement with it. 
where you, the person who is saying, I agree to be a member, that you are placing yourself in a position where you are under a degree of authority of the leadership of the church, even if that involves discipline. Like, that's kind of a weird thing to talk about. It's not easy, and it's really uncomfortable, but I encourage you, take some time, be in Matthew 18, look at 1 Corinthians 5. That is part of the spiritual growth process. When someone is in a state of deliberate disobedience, like not making mistakes, not, you know, falling short, and gosh, I just wish I didn't keep doing that, it's deliberate disobedience. Someone's saying, I don't care. I'm going to do what I want. It's the leadership's responsibility to get in the middle of that. Why? Because you matter. Because your soul matters. I'm not worried about you losing your salvation, but it is our responsibility to present you as being complete in Christ. This is so much more integrated than I think our culture is ready for. Like, we look at a word like membership and say, oh, it's like a gym. So I sign up, I go, I do my thing, I get my thing, and I'm done. No. Yes, the church is an organization, but it's also an organism. I want you to see one more passage and, and we'll be done. 1 Corinthians 12. This is that body imagery that I was talking about. I just want to look at, at 12, just chapter 12, verse 12. I know I'm going a little long, just hang with me. For even as the body is one and yet has many members... And all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. This isn't me trying to like sneak something in and say, hey, look, it says member, you should be a member. No, member means part. I get that. But it means we are all connected and we all have a job to do. That there's part of the body that's responsible for seeing. There's part of the body that's responsible for hearing. There's part of the body that's responsible for walking. We all need each other. And if I'm not a member, then I am withholding back what the church has the opportunity to make use of. To be clear, okay? Service is part of discipleship. If we are not serving because we refuse to, something's wrong, okay? but there are aspects of service that we limit to membership. And I don't think you would think it's weird to say, if someone's going to be the pastor of this church, should they be a member, as opposed to someone who just shows up occasionally? Should an elder be a member? Should a deacon be a member? I can keep going down, and at some point you're going to go, eh, I don't know, and I understand that. There are ways and places you can serve here without being a member. But if you're going to be in a position of teaching, if you're going to be in a position of leadership, if you're going to be on point for something, we want you to be a member because, again, we care about your soul. And if you're in that kind of a position, you are responsible for the souls and care of others. What I'm saying is I need you. I need your help, okay? We can't do this on our own. I want you to be fully involved and connected and integrated into this body. And I think that the reasons why we hold back for something like this, there's fear. There's an independent streak that is not alien to New England, okay? Maybe a little stronger here, but it happens other places too. You also got to remember that in this day and age, Thessalonica, Philippi, a church, if this were the world of the New Testament, there would be a church in Manchester, a church in Concord, maybe one in Kearsarge, I don't know. 
just be one. And in our consumeristic mindset, as Americans, all too often what we do is we say, okay, I need to find a church that meets my needs, so I'll try this, I'll try this, I'll try this, I'll try this, I'll try this. And if a church doesn't meet my needs, like if my dentist isn't meeting my needs, then I'll just go find a new dentist, I'll just go find a new church. When you have that kind of movement, it can be difficult to know who is among the flock of God, who has been allotted to our care. Membership helps us do that. So this is my exhortation to you, okay? I don't need you to do this today. I don't need you to do this to be my friend. I don't need you to do this to be a Christian. This is just what I'm asking, okay? If you are not, become a member. If you call Trinity Bible Church your home, become a member. And here's what's so cool about this. There will never be a more immediate time when you can apply something from Sunday morning. If you want to put this into practice, okay, all you got to do is not go home. <laughs> Let inertia take over, okay? And then at like 11.45, go downstairs. That doesn't commit you to being a member, but like we've talked about for the past few weeks, it's the first step. Please understand my heart on this, okay? This is because we care. It's not because I'm trying to put notches in a belt or, like I said, win a Cadillac. I don't even like Cadillacs. It's about the care of your soul. I want you, I am desperate for you and for myself to be conformed to the image of Jesus. And this is a great way to help facilitate that. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for this morning, for your word. Thank you that you have put together the local church. That we can be here in this place together. <laughs> Father, you know how different this building is during the week. To be here with the family of God, I just I wish it was more than one day a week. I wish it was more than just a few hours. But thank you that we get to do this. Thank you that you have called us to be a community here. Please be glorified in the work of this church, in the work of the lives of the people here. May be, we be a reflection of your majesty. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand.